Well, we'll move from that bit of turbulence to uh, <laughs> Dr. Shaw's attempt to reduce some of the turbulence. Thank you, Bob. Um, can you hear me at the back with this microphone? It is very noisy on the stage. Can you hear okay? Yeah, good. Okay, so um, it's a great pleasure and honor um, to be here, and it's very nice to see such a, a full room of, of patients and families. I was asked to talk about non-invasive ventilation, um, where we are at the moment, and where are we going. Um, and I guess uh, symptomatic, so what we do um, in our clinics when we're waiting for better neuroprotective um, drugs to come through, we take care of the symptoms that happen in ALS. And I think um, we're particularly busy looking after respiratory and nutritional function. And there have been new developments in both of those areas. Um, I'm going to talk about respiratory function today. So the breathing muscles consist of the diaphragm, which um, forms a layer, if you like, in between the chest and the abdomen, and the intercostal muscles between the rib cage. And when you breathe in, your chest expands, the diaphragm moves down, and the ribs separate, and that draws air into the chest. And then when you breathe out, the diaphragm relaxes, goes back up into the chest, um, and the chest contracts, the intercostal muscles contract uh, so that air is, is breathed out. And uh, respiratory muscle problems are common uh, in ALS. They're not common at the beginning of the disease, um, but during the disease course, uh, it, it, it is very frequent to develop problems with the breathing muscles. And this is one of my patients here, and those of you uh, who know about chest x-rays would be able to see that the diaphragm muscles are higher up into the chest than they should be because they're a little bit weak in, in this patient. And when the breathing muscles be become weak, it may cause various symptoms. It may cause breathlessness, but it might not. Um, depending how much exercise the person is able to do. A common symptom, though, is what uh, physicians call orthopnea, which is breathlessness when lying down flat. It may cause rather nonspecific symptoms, just fatigue during the day, disturbed sleep, frequently waking up at night, drowsiness during the day, morning headaches if the carbon dioxide level in the blood goes up overnight, loss of appetite, and the patient may notice also that they have difficulty in coughing and clearing secretions from the chest. I think I can illustrate this most graphically for you um, from the story given by one of my patients who was 47 years old, he was a carpenter, he had had a diagnosis of ALS three years previously, and he came uh, to my clinic uh, well after the diagnosis was established. And when I first examined him, he had um, moderate weakness in his lower limbs, a little bit of weakness in his hands, but otherwise the upper limbs were quite good. His speech and swallowing were normal, but he was breathless at rest, and he was using his shoulders, shoulder muscles, to breathe. And I'm just going to, if I can get, say your prayers that the video works. Whoops. Let's see if we can. Okay, whoops. Sorry. We'll get there. There's a little. Can we turn the volume up? Three months ago now, wasn't it, in June of this year, so that's when you and I first met. Um, and tell me how you were feeling at that stage. Uh, well, I wasn't really bothered with anything. Right. You know, I couldn't be bothered with my kids, with right. the television, with the newspaper. I just, I 
would just simply be in my own, own world, you know what I mean? Right. So you, you, weren't, you had no interest in yeah, no what interest. was going on no, in life. Neither. And, and was that because you felt poorly, or what was the no, reason no. for that? I didn't feel poorly. Right. I thought I felt all right. Okay. Until so, I seen you. Right. So you had no interest. Um, you know what? How how were you in terms of your general health? Were you eating okay? No, I wasn't bothered with eating. You, you had no no appetite. No appetite. No. And were you losing weight? Yeah, a lot, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so how much weight had you lost in the earlier part of the year, would you say? Well, since I got diagnosed, I know I lost over two stone. Right, okay. But I think I lost a lot more in the last six months than I did in the first year. you did at the beginning. And what about sleeping? How, how were you sleeping? Well, I wasn't really. You weren't sleeping? No, two hours here, an hour here. So you were waking up frequently during the night? Yeah. For any particular reason that you could pinpoint, no, just nothing. couldn't couldn't say why. Couldn't say why. Okay. And when you woke up in the mornings, what did you feel like? The same as well when I went to bed, really. Right. You didn't. Did you feel refreshed, as if you'd had some no, sleep? No. No. Were you getting headaches at all? No, I wasn't getting no headaches. You no. weren't particularly getting headaches no. in the morning. Okay. And and you were complaining at the same time of of being easily breathless. And so oh, yes. weren't you? Yeah. You, 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 I couldn't talk. You, you couldn't talk at times no. because your breathing was was so affected. That's right, yeah. And I remember when I first met you, you were using your shoulder muscles to breathe. That's almost. Right, yeah. Okay, so that I hope you can understand him. He's from Newcastle in the northeast of England. I have to warn you before we see his next video that he calls his wife our lass and his little daughter the bairn, so you know um, what he's saying when we come to the, that they are idiosyncrasies of that part of England. So to help those symptoms which can creep up quite insidiously, that chap didn't really feel he wasn't well, um, but he noticed a dramatic difference when he went on to non-invasive ventilation. And many of you will know about this system, a little box that sits by your bed, and then a mask of various different sorts uh, that assists the breathing muscles. And I think it made a big difference when this non-invasive system came through. Previously, there was tracheostomy ventilation where a hole made in the windpipe and the person attached to a life support machine. I think um, Non-invasive ventilation is, is more acceptable, really. Home care is more feasible, speech is better preserved, and uh, importantly, the patient can control whether they use the system or not in a way that's very difficult with a tracheostomy. So when we started um, uh, look, looking into this, I saw uh, a solicitor from Scotland who came down to see me in Newcastle, and he had noticed dramatic benefit when he was put onto non-invasive ventilation. But at least in the UK, before we could make that available for patients, we had to find robust evidence that it was of benefit. Um, so we started asking some questions. Is NIV well tolerated? Is it difficult to use? Does it improve life expectancy? and what is the effect on quality of life. And we did some pilot work. This was with my colleagues in respiratory medicine from Newcastle. We looked at criteria for starting NIV, the best measures for the effects of NIV on quality of life, the best predi predictors of benefit, and then power calculations to enable us to do a randomized trial. And in the UK, we had to do that randomized controlled trial to get the robust evidence. I'm not going to go over all of this. I'll just show you some highlights. So we wanted to look at the impact of NIV on quality of life. Uh, we wanted to see what were the best criteria for starting it and whether patients with bulbar problems are able to tolerate non-invasive ventilation. And the first thing we found was that how good your breathing muscles are 
which is measured along here. This is uh, the uh, maximum inspiratory pressure, which is a measure of how strong your breathing muscles are, plotted against quality of life um, with a particular quality of life scale. And there's a really close correlation between your well-being, how well you feel, and how good your breathing muscles are. And the next thing that we found when we did a pilot study of putting patients on NIV when their respiratory muscles became a little weak, what we found was that uh, this, this is a measure of uh, quality of life on a, an SF36 form, the mental components uh, summary. What we found was that when patients in respiratory failure went on to NIV, their quality of life dramatically improved, and it stayed improved over many months of follow-up, despite the fact that some of the symptoms of ALS were deteriorating over that time. And what we found, the best predictors of people that would benefit from non-invasive ventilation was this symptom of orthopnea, a feeling that you can't get your breath when you lie down flat, a rise in daytime carbon dioxide level in the blood, or episodes where the oxygen level in blood drops down during the night. What we did find, though, were, were that patients who had significant bulba problems, difficulty with speech and swallowing, were less able to tolerate the non-invasive ventilation for long periods of time and derived less benefit than patients who had good bulbar function. So I'm just going to show you now my patient Jerry, the carpenter, describing, I hope. So we then tried you with this describing what happened after he went on to NIV. And what did you, how did you find that when we first tried it? Was it difficult to get used to it? I want to say it was difficult. I think it was the same thing with me, and I just couldn't be bothered with it. Right. I didn't okay. realize then it was doing me the world of good, so I couldn't okay. balance, put it down. Right. So and after a few days, it, you just put it on and forget about it. Really. Okay, so it took two or three nights to, to be able to use it for hours at a time. That's right, yeah. Okay, and, and then within a short time, you were going to sleep with it on, were you, and, and yeah, using right. it for hours. How, so how do you use it now at night? Exactly the same, I put it on, I haven't seen a bit much to tell you with it, I right. didn't fall asleep. Okay, and, and how long do you keep it on at night now then? Uh, about 10 hours. 10 hours. Okay, so, and, and what, do you, do you find it's made you feel any differently from yeah. how you felt in June? I think that's understatement there. Uh, right, so it's so... all my energy. Right. I wake up in the morning, I wake up with last summer in the bed. Oh, right. I want to read the newspaper, which I want to do everything in a day you now. Okay, so that you've got a lot more energy, a lot more oh, interest. Yeah, yeah we well, okay. go up and I'm hungry. I want my dinner. Okay, you've got your good appetite. Yeah, I'll be going for a meal when we leave here. Right, and and have you gained a little bit of weight? Do I you gained think? a lot of weight in that two months I gained over half a stone. Right, okay. Which is fantastic. Yes, really. yes, you can see the difference as well. Um, and your little girl, remind me how old your little girl three, is, Lydia? Three, three, three. So you've got a lot more time for her than, oh, you, than you did have. We, we make sure we do something every day now. Right. Go to Scarborough, go to Chester Zoo, right. even go to Ikea and let her play with the family. Right. It's all fun and right. it's great now. Right, that's very good. And what about your sleeping pattern now? So you said before, earlier in the year, you were waking up lots of times during the night and not really feeling refreshed in the morning. Yeah, Has well, it made a difference to how you sleep? Matter. I don't say the sleep, but I'm going to sit there later there all night when I wake up, I feel great. I feel right. as I want my breakfast and a cup of coffee when I wake up. Right. But to be, be honest, before I used to wake up and, 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 and forget about the breakfast. I want to sit and shout at me for not eating. And, but then you don't feel hungry. Right, so if if... How would you compare your quality of life now with what it was like in May, June time? It's got to be 100 percent better. Okay, so a good example um, from that patient of just what a difference it made. So this was the study where we um, 
compared patients going on to non-invasive ventilation with what was then standard uh, respiratory care in the UK. 92 patients enrolled in the study, and of those, 41 met the criteria for NIV, and they were randomized into either standard care or non-invasive ventilation. And we looked then at the life expectancy and several measures of quality of life. I won't go into all the details, but in a nutshell, the patients that went on to NIV did dramatically better, both in terms of life expectancy and quality of life, especially if they had good function of the bulbar muscles. Um, patients with weak bulbar muscles did less well. They did get some quality of life benefit, but they were not able to tolerate the machine for as long as the patients who had good bulbar function. So that is now approved in the UK, and it's, it's been made more and more available to, to patients. I think I'll skip over that in the interest of time. So where are we going now? I think there are several important questions still to be answered. Can we improve and optimize the pathway of care? Can we improve the early detection of respiratory failure? As um, Noah just explained, actually measuring the strength of respiratory muscles can be difficult for various reasons in ALS. Can we improve the disease course with cough assist devices and does stimulation of the diaphragm muscle add to the benefit of NIV? And just very quickly, I'm going to skip through those. Um, so we're doing, um, to, in terms of trying to develop an improved pathway, we're really doing a qualitative research study with patients, family members, healthcare staff in the community. Uh, this is funded by NIHR Research for Patient Benefit, and some of the initial results from that study are presented as posters um, during this symposium in Chicago. Can we better detect respiratory muscle problems so that we can intervene with NIV at an early stage? Um, and again, I won't go into all the details, but the standard ways of measuring the strength of breathing muscles, force vital capacity, maximum inspiratory pressure, sniff pressure, um, all can have their problems uh, in patients with uh, ALS. And actually measuring blood gas levels um, in the blood is also a rather nasty invasive procedure that involves sticking a needle into the artery in your wrist. So we wondered if there was a way of actually measuring this a little bit better. And what we came up with was this little Tosca machine. And basically what you do, so when the patients come to the clinic, they get this little probe uh, put on their ear, the earlobe is warmed up, and you can get a, a reading of the carbon dioxide level in the blood through the skin of the ear. And we did a study in 40 patients, so Mohammed Rafiq did this, and what he showed was that the measurements you get with the Tosca correlate very well with arterial um, blood gases. So it's a much nicer and less invasive way of measuring oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood. When we put a patient onto NIV, very often people do really well for a while, but then coughing becomes a problem. And there's nothing worse than having secretions in your, in your throat and chest and not being able to cough with sufficient force to clear them. And one patient who also happened to be a lawyer um, really convinced me that maybe we should be doing something more. So this gentleman, he was one of the rare patients who actually presented his initial symptom was weakness of the breathing muscles. And all his other functions, bulba, upper limb, lower limb functions were good. He was put on to NIV at an early stage, went off and got married, and did really well for about 16 months. And then he came back, transferred to my hospital in Sheffield from another hospital, really 
desperately ill. He'd been in a neighboring hospital for three weeks. He couldn't take his NIV system off. He hadn't eaten a meal for three weeks. The chest physios had been pummeling his chest, trying to get him to cough. And you can see the reason for his distress. He blocked off one of the bronchus, one of the airways, to the lower lobe of his left lung. And I thought we were going to have to get a respiratory physician to do a bronchoscopy to clear, clear that airway. But an enthusiastic physiotherapist on the ward said, just before you do that, would you mind if I try him with this cough assist machine? I've just been loaned it, and I'm looking for suitable patients to try it on. Well, two goes with this cough assist machine, and he'd cleared that left lung base. He took his mask off and ate the first meal that he'd had in three weeks, and then did very well um, with a cough assist device alongside his NIV after that. Again, in the UK, we have to have the evidence that these machines help patients before our healthcare providers will fund them. So we're actually doing a randomized trial of cough assist funded by uh, the Motor Neurone Disease Association, and we're comparing a cough assist machine with breath stacking. And I won't go into all the outcome measures. 40 patients took part in that trial, and the results should be available in the next three or four months. And finally, you've already heard all about diaphragm pacing from NOAA. Um, and just to show you what the electrode actually looks like when it's working, you see it's on, on the underneath surface of the diaphragm, and it's stimulating the diaphragm muscle to contract. Again, we can't um, give patients that system in the UK, so the equivalent of the FDA, the European Medicines Regulatory Agency, hasn't approved uh, diaphragm pacing for use in ALS, so we've got to gather the evidence, and my colleague in Sheffield, Chris McDermott, is leading a multi-center study in six sites in the UK where 108 patients will help us test that out. So patients will go on to either NIV on its own or NIV plus diaphragm pacing. So I'm going to end there by just saying we're, we all want more powerful neuroprotective therapies for patients with ALS. As Brian said before, we probably need a cocktail um, of treatments to add to really solve. But in the meantime, much can be done to improve the symptoms during the course of ALS. NIV does for, much more for life expectancy than Rilizol does. Um, and I think in ALS patients, at least those without severe bulbar problems, um, non-invasive ventilation is well tolerated and has a positive impact on quality of life and life expectancy. The further measures in development are detecting weakness of the respiratory muscles at an earlier stage and whether cough assist and diaphragm pacing adds benefit to non-invasive ventilation. And I think I just wanted to end by saying that people with ALS have really made a huge and valuable contribution to developing the evidence base needed for us to bring these approaches to other patients in the clinic. Without patients being willing to take part in testing these new devices out, we wouldn't have the evidence that the healthcare funders need. So I'm just going to end there now, just to thank all my team in Sheffield who um, helped me um, take care of patients with MND. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam.